of the church. Uh, just wanted to um, just say a few things, and uh, um, man, we're, we're so looking forward, and we're praying that all through Advent season we'll be able to be uh, in the church uh, together. So just a reminder, just pay attention on Wednesdays to Facebook. We'll try to send out um, a text message too. So if you're watching this and you're not here with us and you're at home, um, it's vitally important that we have uh, contact information or that you actually would get in the loop and text. Uh, we'll, we'll have that posted here maybe in the comments, uh, what number you can text to to get into the loop so that way we can um, uh, keep you informed too. Those of you who may not be on Facebook very often as far as what's going to happen. I'll try to have a, um, um, a statement on Facebook on text Mon or on Wednesdays between noon and one. They release that information to us uh, Wednesdays at noon. So that's kind of how we'll proceed with that as well. And I want to thank you for, for wearing your mask today. And um, we're doing the best we can to ensure the safety of those that are here. And, um, and we want to continue to have our doors open and do everything we can to, to join uh, in the effort to, to combat this and to not be a cause of a spread or an outbreak, especially within our church. And I know they're not comfortable and they're not great, but let's don't let that, uh, the discomfort of, of the mass and the frustrations that we have with it, get in between us and our worship with God, okay? And so we're looking forward to what God has for us today. Amen, amen. Could we stand? We're going to worship. I want to offer up a prayer for us this morning as we enter into our Advent season and, uh, and uh, enter into the season of hope today that we'll be talking about. Father God, we thank you so much. Um, that we have the opportunity to hope in something greater than ourselves, that we get to be a part of a, a greater story. And so today, Father, as we uh, walk into this, uh, this season of expectation, as we await for the arrival of our King, we wait for the arrival of Jesus, Lord. We just thank you so much, and may you fill us with that hope uh, and that peace and that joy and that love this season. Father, we ask that you to be with us in our time of uh, worship now through song and uh, throughout every aspect of our worship today. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. saying uh, Merry Christmas to each other.
Can I have my ushers forward, please? After I told you to sit down. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Stay right there. You can leave it. You're fine. All right, let's pray for our offering this morning. Father, we thank you once again for the day, Lord, that we get to worship you with everything that we have, with everything that we are, Lord. And I just pray that, um, Lord, we just remove every bit of distraction this morning and that we do what we came here to do, and that's to worship you and nothing else. And we sing of you, praise us to your name, we lift your name on high, and we love you. And so this morning, Father, we just ask that, that you bless this gift and the giver, Lord, and that you help this church, your church, multiply it to fit the many needs of the kingdom. Give us discernment, wisdom, and understanding of how to do so. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. just to bring something that's worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made when it's all about you about you
You can hear me? Yes? Okay. <laughs> Good morning, guys. You can hear me now. All right. Well, during Advent, we're waiting, but not in a boring, sitting around kind of way, because that's no fun. We are waiting in an active way. We have a job to do. We're actively looking and preparing for Jesus to come. The first Sunday of Advent is the Sunday of hope. What is hope? What are you hoping for? We light the first Advent candle today, the candle of hope, as we remember that we put our hope in God, even when our circumstances are really bad. God has worked in our lives before, and he will work in our lives again. We have hope because of who God is. God is our Father, and we are God's people. As we light the candle of hope, we remember that our hope comes from God. We have hope because we are the work of God's hand. And God is working in our lives. Can you help me by saying, our hope is in the Lord, after every line I say? Ready? When the world seems scary or uncertain, our hope is in the Lord. When things aren't as they should be, our hope is in the Lord. When people mess up, our hope is in the Lord. When our circumstances are very good, our hope is in the Lord. You, Lord? are our Father. Our hope is in the Lord. Today we light the candle of hope. Our hope is in the Lord. Thank you, God, that you are with us. Thank you for your faithfulness to your children. May the candle of hope be a reminder today and throughout the Advent season that our hope is in you. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to say, too, um, we're going to kind of go with kind of the things we did before. So if you're seated and you've got some space, feel free to take this off. Um, <laughs> I'm just struggling up here myself, and, and I know you must be, and, um, and uh, just at, at your own, what you feel is safe, what you feel is right to do. If you want to remove that, go for it while you're sitting down. But when you're out in the, in the foyer and stuff, if you're around people, please Please wear that. Hey, turn with me in your Bibles this morning to um, Luke chapter 2. We'll be there in, in a little while, not right away, but just have that kind of ready. We're going to read the Christmas, well, we're going to read a part of the Christmas story this morning, but I'm really excited to um, start this new series today because of what it means and what it stands for. And, and you can see it on the, on the screen. It's, it's Rediscover Christmas, that there is good news in troubling times. Do you believe that? Do you believe we're in some troubling times? Yeah. Do you believe there's good news in it amidst it? Yes, very much so. And so, you know, there's a lot of, um, every generation, I think, and I want you to start thinking about some of yours, every generation uh, has its where were you when questions, right? Uh, do you guys remember the Alan Jackson song, where were you when the world stopped turning, right? Uh, 9-11, that would have been my generation. You know, all of us in here probably experienced that except for maybe our kids. Um, but uh, these are like cataclysmic events that happen in our life when we can step back and say, where were you when? Maybe you're saying uh, this morning, I'm not going to date anybody because I don't know, but maybe you can remember when uh, Neil Armstrong uh, landed on the moon, right? Maybe you can say, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I look over, <laughs> oh man, <That> was <laughs> I'm so sorry, <laughs> I look <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> professionalism. All right. Uh, <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> uh, if we can't have fun at church, what can we do, right? Amen. I look over at Terry's. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me let me pray real quick. Lord, please help me. <laughs> All right. I love you guys so much. Um, <laughs> where were you in? Uh, uh, when Martin Luther King or JFK was shot, maybe some of us remember. <laughs> maybe some of us remember that. <laughs> Where were you when dinosaurs? <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. <clears throat> Let's get serious. Whew, that was not planned. <laughs> oh, I miss church. I miss you guys. Um, <laughs> Where were you, this is for maybe my generation, uh, members that um, a lot, all you guys will if, you're, if I say my generation, I know I'm one of the younger ones, but um, when Columbine happened, yeah, you remember that? Jeremy, you were still in high school probably when that happened? High school, maybe middle school, college? Yeah, and so uh, Columbine, or like I said earlier, 9-11, almost every one of us know <laughs> where we were. I was in ninth grade when 9-11 happened. Yeah, I was in at Huntington North High School in the, in the health room, in the mirror room, in the gym, and I remember watching it on the news. We, everybody has this where were you when uh, moment in their life. You know, you can think of some other ones that are big and, and key in your life as well. But here's the thing. I would argue that, that every single one of us have one that we share, no matter how old you are today. Okay, and that's probably this. You know, where were you when you first discovered or first realized that this coronavirus thing was, was real? Right? It, was, it wasn't just something that was going on. I remember when I first heard it, I was like, oh, whatever. And then, you know, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's affected us every day since then. You know, we've been living this for most of our lives this year. But I'm talking about these, these big moments in life, these, these moments that, that change the course of our lives. There's no going back. There's a huge culture shift, and nothing ever really is the same. And the thing about these kinds of events and these things that happen, they strike with no warning. We, we had no clue the events of, or at least us, the, the, the events that would happen at 9-11 or Columbine or, or JFK or, or the, the, the moon landing and all those different things. We, we had no clue. And they, these, they just happened. Some changed for the good and some most often not. But this year, I would say, um, it has been a crazy year filled with uncertainty even as we stand here today and sit here today and worship God, we are still uncertain whether we're going to be in the sanctuary every week. It's just full of uncertainty. And it's probably made a top ten list, at least of my life, you know, I think a, a global top ten list of, uh, of years for unexpected events that lead to uncertainty. I mean, think about it. Our, 
our news headlines seem like there's something straight out of the tabloids. I mean, seriously, think about it. something straight out of a sci-fi thriller, sci-fi movie. It's crazy. We've been living it for a year. We've seen global pandemic, economic recession, record unemployment. We've seen uh, a political division. Oh, have we ever seen that and still are seeing it. We've seen cultural upheaval, racial reckoning, record wildfires. And as cool as this sounds, it's probably not so cool for the people that experienced it, but fire tornadoes. I mean, doesn't that sound just really epic, fire tornadoes? <laughs> uh, not so much for the people that had to experience it. But we've seen, what, killer hornets or bees or whatever they were. We've seen all sorts of different crazy things this year, floods and hurricanes. Have I missed anything? Probably. Huh? Lo flying locusts? This, no, that's... Should I hold something up and say, let my people go this year? Should I, should I do that? You know, let God's people go, right? Uh, I want to suggest, though, that we have a new word for this year. Does everyone have a cell phone? A smartphone these days? So here's, here's this new word for us. I want you to tell me if you know what this word means. This new word, and it was actually added to the lexicon this year. It's called doom scrolling. You ever heard it? Uh, it, it's a new word. It's called doom scrolling. And you know what it is. You probably do it without realizing it. It's when you're just scrolling through your news feed, right? Your social media news feed or just whatever news outlet you listen or watch to, hopefully not CNN. But anyways, I digress. And so you're scrolling through and you're just watching it. And, and it's just horrific news one after another. That's what doom scrolling is. And hopefully, just hopefully, church, I'm praying that we <laughs> learn to put the phone down. Uh, delete Facebook from your, from your phone for a couple weeks if you need to. Take a break. Get away from it, especially before bed, because doom scrolling, and I can testify to it, man, it can sink anybody into depression. It's just one bad thing after another. Now listen, I'm not trying to bring us all down here quite the opposite. I, I want us to be um, full of hope this year. But there's this reality that we've been living in this Really weird year this year. This really tough year. But here's the thing, church. If there's ever been a year that we need Christmas, <laughs> it's this year. If there's ever been a year that we need the hope of Christmas, it's this year. Church, if there's ever been a year that we need Christ, friends, it's 2020. It's this year. And I praise the Lord because guess what, church? We've made it to Advent. We've made it here. And because of that, it means it's nearly Christmas. It's a season of hope. Advent is all about hope. The very word Advent itself means arrival or, or coming. Advent is a time of expectation. It's a time of waiting, anticipation, and longing. You see, Advent is not just a, an extension of Christmas that some of us believe, that it's, that it's these, these four weeks that we just talk about leading up to Christmas. We are in the Christmas season. This Christmas season is this whole, this whole month. And then even, you don't know about it, but even after Christmas, we may talk about the 12 days of Christmas coming uh, this year as well. But it's this whole time. It, it's, this, it's this season that links the past, the present, and the future all together. Because Advent offers us, church, an opportunity to share in that ancient longing of Jesus Christ, our Messiah, coming to the earth, that we can celebrate his birth and that we can be alert for when he's coming back. And that's what I mean when I say past, present, and future, because we get to look back in, in, in celebration at the hope that was fulfilled when Jesus came on Christmas, that very first Christmas. While at the same time, we get to, to look forward and hopeful and eager anticipation to the coming of Christ's kingdom when he returns for us, when he returns for his people. And that's why during Advent, we wait for both. It's an active and assured hopeful waiting it's not just a feeling it's something hope is something we do amen it's not just a feeling hope is something we do advent is a time that we get to prepare our hearts and place our focus on a far greater story than our own it's the story of god's redeeming love for our world it's this that's right and we're going to sing that on on our christmas service See, Advent's not a season of, of pretending to be happy, right? It's not a season where we just grin it and bear it and get through it. As easy as, as, well, as tempting as that is to say in 2020, to just get through Christmas season and, and look for 2021, it's been a tough year. 
Advent is a season of, of digging deep into the reality of what it means that God sent his son to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. It's a season of expectation and preparation and an opportunity to align ourselves with God's presence more than a hectic season of presence, of gifts. And church, I'm inviting you this season into Advent. I know we're so tempted to just grin and bear it and just get through it this year. But let's don't do that. Let's slow down. Let's celebrate. Let's decorate. Let's be with our loved ones. And I'm inviting you to an opportunity to rediscover Christmas. I'd even suggest that church, that's a gift. As horrible as this year has been, I think it's a gift that we get to stand here today and worship God and have an opportunity to rediscover Christmas. Let's, let's turn our focus and look at this year that way. We have been given a gift because this year could have went a lot worse than it has for many people. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to discover, rediscover what this all means, what hope and peace and joy and love mean. All those things that Jesus offers us. And on Christmas Eve, we're going to celebrate the arrival of our Savior, of our Messiah. And so today we begin by rediscovering hope, even when we're surrounded by uncertainty. And so as we look at these Advent themes over the next four weeks, we'll see how we um, see how they relate to and are exemplified and different biblical characters throughout this Christmas story. But first, I want us to understand some of the background to this so we can fully grasp what's going on here. And, and, you know, I think often we look at the season that we have today and we just automatically think, hey, you know what? We have it bad, right? So did Israel way back in the days of the Bible. Uh, They were a defeated nation under the thumb of the Roman Empire. It was a harsh day to live in. It was a time of of conquest and and brutality. It it had been a thousand years uh, since the time of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the the calling out of of God's people. It had been a a thousand years of of being invaded and, and conquered by the enemies like the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the massive empires of the Greek and the Romans. Church, it had been generations and generations, we read that right in the opening passages of Scripture here in the New Testament, that that there's been generations and generations since the formation of God's covenant with humanity, promising a Messiah, promising someone to come and to make things right and, and, and to bless humans and to restore all that we humans have messed up since God's perfect creation. You see, the fulfillment of God's covenant and the coming of the Messiah who was to come and make everything right, this was, this was not just a, a happy idea that drifted in and out of the minds of these Israelites. Hope was something that they clung to. Hope was something that caused them to look forward to something. It, it, it was their deepest hope that sustained them and encouraged them and spurred them on, especially through the thousands and thousands of years of uncertainty and waiting. And I think, church, just like us today, they hung on to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 13, where he said, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And, and, and just like we know the Israelites to do, they're thinking, how long, O oh God? But how long? It's this, this cry that the Israelite people had. How long, Lord, are we going to be able to keep this hope alive? How long can it survive? Especially under this world-changing force of the Greeks and the Romans who were oppressing them. And we look at their story and we think, were there even embers of hope left smoldering? But then we read this story in in Luke's account and his narrative, and, and we say affirmatively that yes, there's hope. And so spoiler alert for you, Jesus, the Messiah, was born on that first Christmas day. We know that, right? It's no surprise. But I tell you that because we're going to pick up this story in a a pretty unusual place today. See, most of the time we end our story, our Christmas narrative with Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the stable. And the shepherds come and they visit and they, they go back to their flocks in the field. But there's another scene, another Christmas scene that comes right after that scene. And if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, verse 22 through 38. This is what it says. 
And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had revealed to him by the, or, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death, for he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit to the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, "Lord." Now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel uh, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from the time she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God, and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Church, Simon and Anna here, they were sparks of hope for Israel. And more than that, they were really, they were torches of hope for Israel. They were expecting God to come through and do what he had promised as we should be too, right? And so they believed that it was going to happen. When God spoke, they believed. When God speaks, we should believe, church. He's, he's got something in store for his church, okay? And, and they were waiting for it to happen. And when we look at this story and we look into Simon and Anna's life just a little bit more, we see that they're both alike. They have both lived uh, uh, long lives. Uh, they were... Uh, they have seen and experienced many things throughout their life. Both had, had hardships. Her husband died after seven years of marriage, and she was a widow till she was 84. That couldn't have been easy. There was pain in their lives. And we know Anna specifically, like I said, was a widow for, for decades. And, and that was a position of low status in that culture. We both know Anna, though, and Simon remained faithfully devoted to God in their hardships. Because they were ready to see God do great things. Church, I'm ready to see God do great things. Are you? It's been a tough year. And I just know God is going to do some great things. And if we notice here in Luke's account that neither Simon or Anna seem the least bit surprised or uncertain about the fact that this baby, this baby is Jesus he is the long-promised Messiah. They're not surprised because if we look throughout Scripture, almost everyone else in the Christmas story, it took a little convincing, especially Joseph, <laughs> you know? Granted, many of them had angels appear to them with a heavenly announcement, catch them off guard. Remember the angels, one of the first things the angels would always say is, do not be afraid because <laughs> how, man, how, what a sight that would be. That's right. You know, maybe God knew that Simon and Anna might have a heart attack if an angel appeared to him. I mean, what a sight that would have been. They were, they were so old in age, you know. But I think there's more than that. I, I, think, I think God didn't need an angel to get a message across to these two faith agents. I mean, they were ready. They were tuned in. Simon and Anna, they were watching and waiting and listening and expected. They were expecting they were filled with hope. And that hope made them ready. Church, if we're filled with hope, we're going to be ready for what God's going to do in the midst of this season we're in. Day after day, year after year, Simon and Anna had served God faithfully. 
inspired and fueled by the hope that God was at work, even though they couldn't see it. They fostered new and, and, and renewed hope as they set their focus on God, worshiping Him and serving Him and serving others and, and taking, this is the important part, they were taking one faithful step after another as they waited all throughout their lives. And of course God came through because He said He would do. That's what God does. And we have proof. The Messiah is here. And they rejoiced. And they celebrated. And because of that rejoicing and that celebration, which is what we can do too, church, even in this time, we can rejoice and we can celebrate because Jesus is alive. Amen? I know that's a different message for Easter, not Christmas, but we can rejoice. And when we do that, just like they did, it infuses new hope into people around them. We can sit and we can waller in 2020 and COVID all the time. Or we can celebrate that the king has come. I think of people like Mary and Joseph who needed that hope. I mean, they're trying to figure out not only how to be parents, but how to be parents to God's son. <laughs> to be parents to Jesus, the Messiah. I think they reveal several things about us. Simon and Anna, they teach us so much about hope this morning, church. And the first one is this. Is that hope sees beyond. Church, hope is the fuel of our faith and our dreams and our possibilities. That's what hope is. Without hope, we have nothing, right? See, hope is that whisper in our heads and our hearts of just maybe, just maybe. Hope is the spark of darkness that catches flame. Hope is that, that little flicker of light on a new day. And church, I'm going to tell you, no matter how bad your year has been, no matter what kind of problems and struggles you're facing right now, no matter what kind of pain you are in, and let me encourage you not to abandon hope this year. Hope is still alive, and it is, it is active, and, and, and even in our deepest moments, in our, in our greatest pain, in our worst of circumstances, hope is still alive. Hope chases away the darkness and uncertainty of 2020. Hope is alive because God is with us. Amen? Romans 8, is a, is a, if you want to turn there, you can. I'll, I'll share a few verses, but it, it's one of my favorite chapters in, the, in all of the Bible. And, and it starts off, uh, Paul starts off and he clarifies this statement. In, in verse 1, he says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a promise that is for us. He, he then explains, and he goes on in this chapter, he then explains that our relationship as God's children's Children, it should be lived in God's Spirit, lived in by the Holy Spirit. And then he shifts, um, shifts to our future when God will fulfill his work in us and restore creation. And he reads this, and it reads this in verse 24, 25, and 26. This is good. It says, For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Let me read that first part again. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Church, listen to me. Hope exists before reality comes to pass. That's what hope is. Hope exists before reality comes to pass. Now, listen. You can hope all you want all day long that I have a $100 bill. I'm not going to show you how much it really is. That I have a $100 bill here in my pocket just for you, right? You, you can hope that I'm going I'm to take it out of my pocket and I'm going to walk down to one blessed person and give them this $100 bill. It's not $100. And, and, <laughs> and you, can, you can think about it, church. You can expect it. You can tell yourself, hey, I'm going to walk. It's going to be me. I'm going to walk out of church today $100 richer than when I came in. But here's the thing. Hope exists before reality comes to pass, right? So as soon as I give you that $100 bill, hope is over. There's no need for it. You, you can't keep hoping it will happen because it already has. Does that make sense? Hope precedes our present reality. Hope by its very nature exists in the uncertainty before. Are, are you tracking me, church? 
We're in, living in some time of uncertainty, but that's where hope exists. The hope for something greater. And we already know what it is. It's Jesus Christ. That he has something far greater than what we're experiencing now for us, for those who are in Christ. Hope does exist. It exists in questions. It exists in the doubts. It exists in the unclear sense of what is going to happen, what's going to come, what is tomorrow going to look like. But hear me, hope is the willingness and desire to believe beyond what our present circumstances in reality are presenting to us, right? Hope is that, that ability to see all the stuff that's going on in our lives and to see past it. That's what hope is. And, and verse 26 is so vitally important to us in that Romans 8 passage. It says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. It's so important, and it leads me to the second point is this, that God is with us. Here, now, and always. Church, with God, there is no uncertainty. And God knows your pain. God knows the things you're faced with right now. He knows the struggles you're going to have when you leave this place, the struggles you have sitting in your pew right now. God knows your pain, he, your challenges. He knows your struggles. Listen, God was not surprised at all, not one least bit of drop at all, when this coronavirus mutated and spread and did whatever it was going to do. God wasn't surprised that that was going to happen. He wasn't surprised when the, the economy froze and sunk for a while, or it's doing this right now. I don't know what it's doing. He was not surprised when you got that dreaded diagnosis. God was not surprised when you got that, that phone call in the middle of the night that you weren't expecting to get. God was not surprised when you got that, that news or you heard those words that broke your heart or shattered your world or left you in confusion and uncertainty. Listen, he sees you. He's here with you. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And this hope that he delivers, that he offers, is not this, this measly hope that he dangles just out of our reach. That's not what his hope is. It's not like, oh, you want this, don't you? you? You can't have it. You want it, but you can't have it. It's like that $100 bill that I was trying to share with you. It's not that at all. It's hope that he infuses within us. It's a hope that was filled in us when we first believed. It's a hope that has continued to be fanned in us through the Holy Spirit's power in our lives even in our weakness, even in our bleakest of times, even in our grim circumstances and deepest pain, even when hope seems too far away, e even when the ability uh, to hope seems to be slipping out of our grasp, the Spirit's still there. His Spirit is there to help restore us by reminding us of God's faithfulness and his promises. His spirit leads us into God's word where we are reminded of all that God has done for us and all that he's going to do. He is our God. He is our Emmanuel. He is the one who's with us always, who will never leave us nor forsake us. He has promised his people all throughout history. He has promised us today with messages of hope. And I want to read two of them straight from Scripture. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Sorry, I had a different translation up there. There are tremendous hope in these words. Church, we are not alone, even at our loneliest and darkest of times. Christ has come. He is with us now and always. That leads me to number three. You know those, those signs that we always see, like, keep calm and carry on? 
Well, hope inspires us to carry on. That's what hope does. The Apostle Paul describes this, this cycle of life in the Christian life here in Romans 5. And he explains that because of Jesus, Romans 5, that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Sorry, I had the wrong translation up there again. This hope from God, from His Spirit, it does not put us to shame. It will not let us down. It will not disappoint us. Instead, it gives us new and growing strength to see beyond the pain and the confusion that's in front of us. That's what hope does. To see past the present reality. There's this really empowering story that I shared on Facebook a while back. I don't know if anyone watched it just this past week. Uh, of, a, of a man named Captain Tom Moore. Did anyone see it? He made national news headlines. Um, it's a pretty amazing story. Um, he became a, a, a national hero, or not even national, global hero. Um, uh, he actually is now called Captain Sir Tom Moore. He was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. Um, he is a man who was from England. Uh, he was 100 years old, and he raised nearly $40 million dollars for the uh, British healthcare system to help fight COVID-19. And he did it by walking 100 laps around his garden. So this man walked 100 laps for 100 years, wearing his, his navy blue uh, blazer decorated with all his medical, uh, his medical, his medals, I mean, and not medical medals, but his military medals. <laughs> and he's walking around his garden. He even fell and hit his head at some point, too, and, and had to take a break from it. And came back still. They weren't sure if he was going to make it, but he did. And, and, and his daughter ended up sharing this on a charity website. He was trying to raise a dollar a lap just, to, just so he could do it. But he ended up like inspiring so many people. I encourage you to go to my Facebook page and watch it. Scroll, scroll back a couple days. And he inspired so many people, so many kids in, in wheelchairs with, with muscular dystrophy and, and, and cerebral palsy and all these different things to get up and to get active and to, get, and get, and to move and to, to do something and, and that they can do it and all these different things. He became such a national uh, inspiration to so many people. But here's the thing. There's a, there's a lesson of hope in that for us. And I want you to listen to Tom's words. He said the first step was the hardest. He said after that, he said I got into the swing of it and I kept going. Hope inspires us to keep moving. The first step is the hardest. Isn't that so true for so many things for us, especially this year? When life seems so out of place, when it seems so hard to lift our, our downcast, tear-filled eyes to look for that tiny spark of hope, sometimes it feels like things just swallow us up. Pain, struggles, things we face, years. <laughs> it seems so difficult at times to reach beyond the troubles and, and grasp the Lord's outstretched arm. Sometimes it can feel so impossible to take that first step towards, towards hope when we're weighted down by our burdens. But I want to tell you, church, when, when we receive the promise of, of hope in God's word, when, when we find new strength, when we uh, accept the power of, of hope that's granted to us in God's spirit, we find new inspiration. When, when we focus on the power of hope embodied in the birth and life and death and resurrection and eternity of Jesus Christ, we discover new strength to take that next step and to keep on going and to keep on stepping and walking and maybe even running. But here's the thing, friends. We can only take one step at a time. Hope inspires us. Hope emboldens us. Hope builds upon hope, and it keeps us going forward no matter what. And so I ask you this morning, what does the next step of hope look like for you this year? What does the next step of hope in your life, in your struggle, in your pain 
look like for you this year? So often we as humans, we, we want to see what happens tomorrow. We want to know what the future holds. We want to skip to the end of the story. But our lives just don't work like that, do they? We haven't been granted that privilege. But in Christ, we have been given the end of the story ultimately. In Christ, we have been given true life that transcends past the pains of earth and the brokenness of our present world. Because in this Advent season, we can find hope in the arrival and the life of Jesus Christ. And we can draw hope from God's faithfulness in fulfilling his long-awaited promise of the Messiah. We know it's coming. We can focus on the hope of, of God's continued work in and all around us. That will one day take away even the need of hope as we realize the reality of God's full restoration. See, that's the thing. Hope is a gift that God has given us for our time on earth. There's going to come a day where we're not going to need it anymore. Because, once again, <laughs> hope precedes our present reality. And Jesus is what we hope for. He is our hope. And church, I just want to encourage you one last time. In the midst of whatever life is throwing at you, just know that we can experience the hope of God's Spirit within us carrying us, strengthening us, emboldening, emboldening us, and giving us the strength to take the next step before us. And so, friends, my invitation to you is this, is that you would take a step towards hope this Advent season because hope is dawning, Christ is coming, and the promise is he's returning again. And so let us welcome him into our hearts and lives every day this season as we expect great things from him can we stand with me and i want to pray and give us a benediction here and then we'll dismiss let's bow our, eye, our heads and close our eyes here before i pray i just want to ask you to just take a moment where do you need hope this season I know this seems like a, a message that, that we preach every year on, on the hope, love, joy, peace, all those different things. But it's for a reason. And like I said earlier, if there's ever a season that we need Christmas, that we need each other, it's this season. And so I want to pray that God fills you with all that hope. And so as I pray, pray along with me. Father, we thank you for the hope that you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, we hope and we long for your return. Until then, though, we wait in eager anticipation, full of hope for a future spent with you. Give us strength to push through and past all the uncertainty in our world and to keep our focus on you. Lord, be with those who aren't with us today. Be with those who are with us today in person or online. Father, may your hope seep out of these walls and out of these people and into the lives of everybody they come into contact with. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And church, I leave you with this passage. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13, you are dismissed.